This installment of the Anguilla Financial Services Commission's FinTech and Compliance webinar series was recorded on location at Tranquility Beach in Anguilla, British West Indies. Our topic for today is digital innovations, rapid responses, and regulatory synergies, cryptocurrencies, tokens, and exchanges, and the future of financial services. Our guest speaker for today's discussion is a current employee of Cypher Trace. Who is Cypher Trace? It is a team that provides cutting edge technology for, for blockchain analytics for cryptocurrency intelligence. The company was founded in 2015 by David Givens with a vision to enhance the safety, security, and compliance of cryptocurrencies. CypherTrace technology has the ability to trace over 800 virtual assets, including Bitcoin, Ether, Tether, and most recently, Monero. John Jeffries, JJ, is CypherTrace's chief financial analyst and the chairman of the Travel Rule Information Sharing Alliance, TRISA. JJ has held leadership positions in a variety of cybersecurity companies over 20 years. He is a frequent speaker of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and cybercrime. Mr. Jeffries joined CypherTrace from Samsung Strategic Strategy Innovation Center, where he led blockchain initiatives. Previously, JJ served as the GM of Abaca the email filter that used machine learning to process 6 billion messages daily from Yahoo, AT&T, and Apple iCloud. Prior to Abaca, JJ served as Vice President Marketing at Iron Key, the world's most secure flash drive, which was originally founded by the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology. Before Iron Key, JJ held senior marketing positions at leading cybersecurity companies. Mr. Jeffries obtained his MBA from the Ivy School of Business in London, Ontario, and his BA in business from Michigan State University. We welcome you today to our discussion, Mr. Jeffries. Thank you. Mr. Jeffries, as I mentioned before, is a current employee at Cypher Trace. So, Mr. Jeffries, or JJ, should I call you JJ? Yeah, it's probably more, more conversational than Mr. <laughs> Jeffries. All right. JJ, can you tell us a bit about the work that is being done currently by Cypher Trace? Sure. Cypher Trace is a cryptocurrency intelligence company, which means we actually augment the public blockchains using extensive attribution collection techniques and machine learning to make sense of the cryptocurrency entities transacting in, crypt in crypto. So what we're able to do is essentially create a yellow pages of the cryptocurrency businesses and then use that intelligence to power a series of solutions. Our first solution was really focused on financial crime. So also funded by the DHS originally to help identify and trace drug dealers and follow terrorist financing. Uh, the solution has been extended uh, tremendously since uh, using the same core intelligence of the knowledge of the blockchain businesses, we're able to risk rate transactions and provide anti-money laundering services for cryptocurrency businesses. Right. We're also able to use that intelligence to provide a view of the risk profile for cryptocurrency en entities. So this information is used by regulators worldwide to assess the risk of various different entities and see how much of each type of potentially tainted uh, currency they're sending and receiving. This intelligence is also used by the banking community to be able to monitor their payment transactions mm -hmm. for cryptocurrency flows, and then specifically identify the transactions 
flowing to and from high risk virtual asset service providers. Right. All right. So in other words, crypt cipher trace is basically a, a tool that monitors the way cryptocurrencies are used and, and, you know, trace their, their use, um, specifically for combating any crime related activities or criminal related activities, um, in the crypto space. Exactly. So right. we're really looking to, you know, grow the crypto economy by protecting both businesses and financial services and governments from the risks of money laundering and terrorist financing. Right. So that means you guys work very closely with CFATF, am I correct? Absolutely. We work uh, very closely with, regu all, with regulators globally. Right. Including CFATF. Right. So the next question, um, speaking about, you know, the way that the technology developed by Cypher Trace works in that, you know, it, it tries to prevent or curb the use of cryptocurrencies for money laundering and illicit purposes or illicit activities. Um, recently, I read about Cypher Trace's work as it relates to Monero. Um, and Monero, for those that, of you that are watching, Monero is actually a coin that is used, it, it, it is used mostly in illicit and illegal activities, being um, the nature being of privacy. So there's a lot of privacy elements involved in the coin. Um, and because of that, um, it's used quite a bit on the dark web. Um, you know, it's probably the second most used cryptocurrency next to Bitcoin on the dark web because of the fact that it's a bit hard to trace um, the use of Monero. That is until, up until August of this year, when Cypher Trace basically finalized the the system or the technology um, to be used by DHS to monitor the use of Monero. So why tell me why is the work that is being done by Cypher Trace as it relates to Monero and other chain analysis? Why is that so important to the financial system and the digital asset space? Sure, I, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, on, on the dark web, uh, Monero is definitely the, a strong number two. Uh, Bitcoin is still, you know, predominant, uh, but Monero has, as you observed, uh, some privacy and anonymity characteristics uh, that enable, or historically have enabled users to transact uh, in a very uh, private manner without user without law enforcement or users being able to identify who they are. Um, this capability actually makes Monero a uh, wonderful money mixing machine as well. Uh, so you don't have to go to a, a mixing service necessarily. You can just pop out to Monero and uh, come back into a different coin and you've effectively mixed your, your currency. So being able to trace Monero was a huge step forward. And, you know, I won't say that we have <clears throat> done all the work we want to do. There's still lots more to be done. It's never going to be quite as deterministic as tracing Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin, we can say with 100% certainty uh, where it's come to or where it's going to and where it's come from. With Monero, we're able to create a probabilistic analysis. And mm -hmm. so what that means is we can, they have a concept of decoys. So we're able to eliminate, say, nine of the 11 decoys and say that this fun, these funds definitely came from one of these two sources. Mm -hmm. Now, this is useful for a couple of reasons. One is, obviously, for law enforcement, they can narrow down their investigations. Right. And at the same time, you know, Monero has characteristics that as, as many people start to use it as or use crypto as a uh, form of internet money, uh, people may want privacy, especially uh, with 
central bank digital currencies coming online. So being able to balance the privacy that consumers might want with the, you know, the needs for investigative services on top of it is, is a critical uh, functional, piece of functionality. And in fact, being able to provide this probabilistic uh, determination will in fact enable exchanges to be able to safely accept Monero knowing that the source of the Monero was not from illicit finance. Right. So, I mean, that is the case, I believe, with any coin or any cryptocurrency, you know, what is it being used for? So while while there are good uses, I'm pretty sure that, you know, Monero can be used for good. It seems like it's it's more used for bad, um, you know, so I guess that that's where Cypher Trace would come in and they would allow the different governmental agencies to actually um, be able to understand and separate the use that is for bad and the use that's for good. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Now, with respect to other chains, you know, that's that's a critical uh, capability as well. So at CypherTrace, we, we got our, our early start on the Bitcoin blockchain and developed our initial set of attribution based on that. But as you know, there's thousands of coins and, and right. multiple different chains. So what we've done is we've, we've architected our technology to be able to approach entire chains at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, so the very first chain we did was the, the Ethereum blockchain. So we extended that to support as all ERC-20 tokens, uh -huh. which based on how our technology works, we get all of them, even the ones that have yet to be designed. Um, so that gives us a, a very unique capability uh, to, to grow with, with the, the community. And we were also the first and only company to provide support for the Binance chain mm -hmm. uh, and thereby also supporting the uh, Binance's di distributed exchange. Mm -hmm. All right. So JJ, I know that, um, you know, cryptocurrencies have exploded in the past, I would say five years or more. Um, although they've been around for quite some time, um, you know, and in, in this recent pandemic environment, we have seen a explosion <laughs> of the use of all things digital, including cryptocurrencies. Um, so tell us what, what are your views on some of the challenges you've seen emerged, not only recently, but in the last few years, you know, as more persons have become more interested in, in cryptocurrencies? Sure. I think, you know, one of the, one of the fundamental issues with crypto is it's just plain old hard to use, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think usability is a, a, a piece that it, 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 people are working on quite diligently. And, you know, as it becomes more of an urgency, uh, as people, you know, don't want to trade paper and, and pieces of metal, mm -hmm. um, there, there's increased effort to make uh, cryptocurrency more usable. Uh, and at the same time, it's becoming uh, considerably more accessible right. as uh, Bitcoin ATMs are springing up by the thousands. Um, so, you know, literally I can walk six blocks and put a hundred dollar bill into a, in, in my local uh, drugs or drugstore or grocery market in their ATM and pull out some, some Bitcoin ATM, some Bitcoin out of that ATM, which with that usability it also creates additional issues uh, and one of the the issues that i've heard from law enforcement uh really over the last couple of years is an increased use of uh, cryptocurrencies in in street crime um where in the past when when arrests are made uh you know there's a lot of cash involved mm -hmm. now they're not seeing cash so uh, you know, it, it's it's a two-edged sword. So the good news is it's become a lot more usable uh, for us. I um I have a card on my on my iPhone that I can load up with crypto and spend it just like a uh, just like a debit card. So it's much more usable mm -hmm. um, for everyone. And so that you know obviously creates uh, money laundering opportunities as there's increased off ramps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other huge trend. And it was sort of more of a science project until very recently, until the last couple of months, was decentralized finance, mm -hmm. which is a, a permissionless uh, ability to trade and, and 
um, exchange derivative type of, of cryptocurrency and hybrid cryptocurrency instruments. And the volume there has grown tremendously uh, such that it's a, I think it's starting to attract the regulators attention um, definitely in the US and, and in Europe. Mm -hmm. All right. So coming out of that question, I would like to ask um, in particular, the Caribbean region, um, do you see, do you see us encountering any challenges, um, in, you know, adapting to, um, you know, the digital asset space or, you know, bringing in cryptocurrencies and, and understanding in the use of cryptocurrencies? Do you, do you foresee, um, the Caribbean and in particular, actually the, the jurisdictions that are known for operating as international financial centers. Um, do you, do you see any challenges being encountered? I believe there's challenges, but I think, you know, more than challenges, there's opportunities, right? And there's the opportunity to, you know, differentiate based on regulatory okay. compliance and, and, safety of the environment. So we're seeing different jurisdictions um, competing or starting to, you know, portray and, and, and project uh, a, a strong regulatory stance. And as, uh, you know, we see things like the travel rule uh, start to unfold, mm -hmm. what, I, what I believe we'll see is there'll be both re regulatory arbitrage, which is, you know, where, uh, cryptocurrency entities go to places with weak regulations because they don't want to be regulated. But at the same time, I think there'll be a reverse regulatory arbitrage where there'll be a, a fleet, a flight to safety. So where you'll have exchanges, the larger exchanges, for example, won't want to, won't want to trade with environments that don't have strong, strong trip cryptocurrency regulation nor enforcement. So I think the challenge is, is to, um, to, to develop that capability and endure probably a short period of, of growing pains while those capabilities are being developed, but then enjoy a longer term uh, competitive advantage. Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, they, they actually do want to be regulated, um, but it's a matter of how much regulation. So it looks good to be regulated you know, but they want to do the bare minimum to be regulated. I think that that is the issue. Um, so, you know, if you want to be regulated, you have to be fully compliant. Um, you know, while yes, there may be some jurisdictions that may have legislation that is lesser than, um, I think that, you know, their aim is just to be regulated, period. It looks good for them. So, yep. okay. So next question. So what are some of the, the high level opportunities that you see yet to be tapped within the, the digital asset space, um, you know, for future use cases? Yeah, so the, one of the biggest opportunities I believe it, it will be around uh, decentralized finance because, you know, at, at the heart of it, it is leveraging smart contracts to create new instruments. Mm -hmm. And so I think that people are just uh, at the very, very early stages of even imagining what this could be. I think, um, you know, once again, it's an interesting area for uh, guidance and regulation because smart contracts themselves are just, you know, pieces of software written by humans. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly they need to have audits and, and safeguards such that you know that there there are no bugs, and the you know the the developers uh, can't run away with with the funds, as in the recent case with uh, the the attempted uh, exit of the sushi swap uh, funds. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that that's a a real opportunity to to drive both the the innovation and to be much more inclusive, because the the nature of DeFi is that it is permissionless. Um, and so I think one of the real challenges is crossing the boundary between uh, customer due diligence and, uh, and permissionless. Right. And making sure that, you know, they check every box um, by every regulator that's involved. Um, and you mentioned due diligence. So making sure that they're, 
in compliance with what is recommended by CFATF and other um, regulatory organizations. Yeah, and it's even a little more challenging than that, right? Because some, the nature of some of these uh, DeFi instruments could be could you know call into to affect banking regulations because they're they could be interest bearing or they could be a lending instrument. Mm -hmm. um, so the you know understanding both the the anti money laundering potential uh, compliance requirements, but also other regulatory um, could be securities law um, mm -hmm. that they may have to comply with as well. So. I think that's a, a really fascinating area and I think we'll continue to see extreme growth throughout the next several years. Yes, the next several years. I was about to add that, um, you know, the fact that these products are, are very, they are not traditional at all. And I think that the other regulators, um, you know, banking regulators and, and security exchange um, regulators, they have yet to wrap their heads around um, this entire concept and, and try to feel out how do these products fit into the current financial system? Because of course it's, it's completely different to what we're accustomed to. It's completely um, different to the traditional services and products that are offered um, in financial si systems. Um, so I think that you know, that in itself is, is a challenge. The, the mindset has to change as well. Um, and once they're open-minded, they'll be more welcoming and we can, you know, move this thing along a bit more quicker and faster. Um, so. Yeah. And I think that's part of the inherent um, tension is that, you know, the, the innovators are, you know, can write a smart contract in a, on a weekend. And, uh, you know, it takes longer than that to write the regulations. So, right. you know, there's a, a mismatch between the, the pacing of the, of the two developments. And I think, you know, there's, there's a risk that some of the hype from the ICO days, uh, mm -hmm. I guess it's more than a risk, um, will, will wash off in, into the, into the definanced, uh, decentralized finance world. And mm -hmm. that, you know, therein lies some, some challenges. Right. All right, so we're gonna drill down a bit further and we are going to get into um, you know, what's happening here on the ground in Anguilla. So as you may or may not know, um, Anguilla was one of the first jurisdictions in the world to actually enact legislation for the regulation of utility tokens. Um, you know, so we currently have legislation which allows for um, service providers in the utility token space to operate. Um, do you see any other opportunities that, you know, can be leveraged for jurisdictions such as Anguilla? For sure. I, um, you know, I think there's a, a lot of opportunities for, for utility tokens. And uh, while as at Samsung, I did a lot of, uh, innovation projects around machine to machine learning or mach the, the machine to machine communication uh, and tra transactions. And I think that's probably, you know, one, one of the areas of interest uh, for sure. And I think as, as these sort of IOT and enterprise blockchains become uh, more realistic, there's some really interesting use cases. Um, you know, w some of the ones that I participated in were around uh, electrical power. Mm -hmm. So uh, being able to, you know, charge a, a, an electric car uh, in a touchless manner just by driving through the, 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 uh, the station, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Another area that I think is, is really interesting is communication. So um, both on the, you know, on the long haul and the short haul side, uh, being able to pre-populate uh, different devices with credit, with utility tokens that provide them credit at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen models, um, and this this would work, you know, in, in an island situation. In in the U.S., we're seeing it in in uh, rural situations where uh, one one uh, host, if you will, has a high speed network connection, mm -hmm. and then share shares that uh, through tokens with their correct the rest of their community. Mm -hmm. So interesting use cases for sure. And um, I think as, as these things start to play out, you know, at a local level, 
there'll be an opportunity to you know exchange and trade these tokens at a on a global level as well and that's where you know there'll be opportunities for different places and particularly places that are more innovative around utility tokens uh to to really you know shine mm -hmm. And with the technologies being developed by Cypher Trees, the possibilities are endless, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, from a blockchain analytics perspective, it's fascinating, right? If you can, you know, if, if I think back to some of my IoT use cases, you know, tracking ships going across the ocean and mm -hmm. containers in those, you can imagine a lot, a lot of blockchain analytics being deployed uh, through on utility tokens and, and corporate blockchains, enterprise blockchains as well. Right. Yeah, I think that the regulator will be a bit more, I don't want to use the word comfortable, but <laughs> um, they would be a bit more comfortable knowing that, you know, they can use this type of technology to monitor um, the space because, you know, it's it's completely new and, and it it is, unlike anything that we've regulated before we've seen before so to know that we have service providers that are in the space that can provide services in tech um, to ensure that you know we have the proper tools to continue um, and enhance the regulatory framework for this type of of space so that's why cypher trace is is it's very important um, for yeah. regulators and governments. And clearly, just like any sort of trade-based money laundering, right? It, right? Even though they're utility tokens, um, you know, they could be used for money laundering. Right, exactly. All right, so next question. All right, so what are your views? I know we, we earlier we spoke about, um, you know, the different regulators in banking and in securities and investment securities and exchanges, them wrapping their heads around this new concept and idea um, as it relates to crypto, cryptocurrencies and, and virtual assets, digital assets. What, 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 what do you think the regulators should consider in scoping to, to regulate digital assets? And I'm, I'm talking beyond what central banks are currently doing for um, central bank digital currencies. Sure. I think, you know, there's, there's a certain level where things are obvious, um, you know, like something just came in through a dark market and that's, that's fairly clear. But I think, you know, the regulators need to, to as the FATF would say, you know, take a, a, a risk-based approach and look at, um, you know, the, the, the potential red flags um, the the FAT have published recently published the red flag uh, indicators of, of virtual asset money laundering. And I think that that document itself is, is extremely valuable and 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 insightful. And also um, a project that we were involved with about a year ago called Project Participate mm -hmm. had uh, correspondingly uh, indicators of compromise. And some of them are subtle. Um, and I think if, if regulators had you know. Those, those in mind as they're framing regulations, it would help inform them or inform the regulations. Yeah, I think that, um, like I said, there, there needs to be a, a complete overhaul of the, the current framework, um, you know, in terms of banking. Um, so other than changing the mindset, there is it's good to take that risk-based approach. Um, you know, there's everything that we're doing right now is actually considering a risk-based approach um, in terms of regulation. So that is one way where we can approach this new space, you know, um, definitely looking at the risk involved and, and not pooling everything in one basket and, and treating everything the same. Um, so, you know, just like how you would have different banking products, different financial services products that do not carry the same level of risk. I think that same mindset needs to be used, um, when you approach this digital asset space. Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, our earlier conversation about Monero is a perfect example, right? Where 
you know, various jurisdictions and VASC can choose to de-risk it mm -hmm. and just say no Monero. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, we all need to figure out how to preserve our privacy, you know, in context of, of a public blockchain. Right. Um, yeah. So being able to ma manage and mitigate those risks. Right, exactly. So you just drop them in the relevant risk buckets and then you just regulate according to the risk presented. Um, like you say, by just mitigating the risk that, that, that presents itself. All right. So we both appreciate that the space is developing rather quickly. What have you gleaned as the touchstones for both sides of the regulatory coin? So I think, you know, from the, from the regulatory side, from the regulator side, it's, it, it's clearly, you know, primary goal is invest protection and to stop illicit finance right but at the same time to support uh, economic development growth and really facilitate uh, capital formation right so it's it, it's easy just to say no um, but that's not what regular you know what the forward-leaning regulators are, are thinking right I think the, the challenge is to to you know to stop the bad stuff but at the same time really enable the good stuff to happen and, and create an environment that fosters innovation. Right. And the commission actually recently launched its innovation office to do just that. So we just do not want to, you know, put up a, a screen in front of everything that is, you know, crypto or everything, any, anything that is from that space. You know, we want to, we want to understand the products and, and we want to have an open mind about you know, whether or not this is something that we should be looking at um, and not just pushing to the side or, you know, not not allowing them to operate. So we 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 are currently receiving requests and, you know, um, persons have persons have um, ideas that they are sharing and, you know, they're just understanding whether or not the commission is open to um you know, regulating this type of business. Um, so, so that is our innovation office and shameless plug, but that um, <laughs> you can visit our website. There's an innovation office tab on our website, fsc.org.ai. And any innovative product that you would like to throw at us and any innovative idea that you have, you can you know, just send us a message through the website and we'll have someone respond to you as soon as possible. A shameless plug. <laughs> shameless. <laughs> All right. So final question. So what capacity building activities can you point to um, for professionals that are seeking to, to get a better understanding of this space? Sure. I think, um, you know, as you're aware, it's a very rapidly uh, moving space, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, makes it challenging, but also super, super fun. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it's really interesting. And so I, I would advise people to, you know, just immerse themselves to, you know, to, to locate a few of the, the, the better publications like Cointelegraph and Coindesk and really, you know, follow them. Um, I would recommend five books. Um, there's five books that I think if you read those, maybe a sixth, you would have a good grasp of things. So the first one being the little Bitcoin book, uh, second one being crypto assets. There's two mastering books, mastering Bitcoin and mastering Ethereum mm -hmm. uh, that are online and free. And then a final one called Cryptocurrency Forensics. Uh, if you read those five books, uh, you would have a very, very solid footing uh, in most discussions around cryptocurrency and understanding uh, how it's traced. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you wanted to sort of have the, the, the history and the, some of the, uh, some, here's some of the legends from the crypto space, I also recommend a book called Digital Gold. Uh, which talks about the early, some of the early players so you can understand, mm -hmm. you know, where Roger Veer is coming from and you can understand, you know, the history of Bitcoin Jesus. <laughs> <laughs>
And what about cipher trace? Is cipher trace involved in any capacity building, um, you know, any training or conferences, workshops, any, any type of sessions that, you know, would educate someone like me or someone else in, in this field that's, that's open to learning more about the space? For sure. So my team publishes a, uh, a regular cryptocurrency anti-money laundering and crypto crime report where we cover sort of the latest trends, the latest crimes, and also the regulatory landscape. Uh, so that report comes out every, about three times a year. Uh, it'll come out in about a month. So th our reports are highly informative. They're required reading by some regulators uh, already uh, for their departments. Mm -hmm. uh, we're releasing a report on KYC, geographic KYC risks mm -hmm. uh, for VAST. Um, That'll be coming out on Thursday, October 1st. So maybe after you hear this recording, but you can go to our website. All the reports are free um, and don't require any, uh, any compromise of your private data um, to, to get them. So you can just go to my website and download those. Uh, we offer training. Uh, we offer a certified cryptocurrency examiner training. It's a one day class. Uh, and also we have regular webinars. So we have, uh, numerous webinars archived that you can uh, view from our website uh, or sign up for a training program. Uh, we also operate the, uh, or I, my side job is I, I run the Travel Rule Information Sharing Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great resource, trissa.io, uh, to figure out how to comply with the growing need to, uh, created from the, the Travel Rule. Mm -hmm. All right. So links to all of these things that JJ would have discussed, um, you know, to the different publications, they will be available towards the end of this discussion and you can access that information through those links. All right, JJ. So I'd like to thank you very much, um, you. for joining me today. Um, I know it's, it's quite sunny. I think the sun came out for you today, actually, because earlier it was actually very overcast. Um, so I'm happy that the sun decided to show its face for our session. <laughs> it came out here as well. Lovely. <laughs> All right, JJ. So thank you very much for joining us and have a good one. You too. The Anguilla Financial Services Commission would like to thank CypherTrace for their participation. Any references within this episode can be found in the links provided below. For more information on our fintech licensed businesses, please contact us by email at innovate at afsc.ai.